pleasure. And I would like to personally thank the voters of Perry uh, for your confidence and re-electing me. I look forward to uh, another great four years as Perry continues to improve each and every day. So thank you very much. Council members, any comments? Thank you. Item three is roll call. We do have everyone here this evening. We have a quorum with all members in attendance. Item four is the invocation and pledge of allegiance to the flag. Uh, Mrs. Peterson will lead us in the invocation, and Reverend King will lead us in the pledge. And if you could stand us this time, we would. <laughs> so much that we can come to you at the very beginning of a brand new year before decisions are made and, and issues decided that we could just come before you and, and uh, ask for your wisdom, for your uh, insight and discernment. And Father, it's the goal of all of our hearts to make decisions that are good for Perry, good for the people that live here. And for the people that have uh, voted and, and wanted us to be decision makers. We thank you for the opportunity and we just are honored by it and ask that you would be present in every decision and every vote taken, Lord. And we just want to glorify you and, and love you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Item five or is going to be the selection of the 2022 Mayor Pro Tem. Council members, at this time, I will entertain any nominations. The floor is open for nominations of, for Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Perry 2022. I nominate Paul. Uh, I second. There's a motion and a second. Are there any other nominations? on the floor at this time. Hearing that, all in favor of, not, of electing Mr. King as the Mayor for 2022, please indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you. It looks 
Select, Mr. Keene. Congratulations. You will be serving as Mayor Pro Tem for 2022, and you will do an outstanding job. So, thank you very much. Item 6, the recognitions and presentations. 6A is a recognition of Mr. Brian Wood for five years of service. Mr. Gilmore?
January the 10th for eight weeks of training at the Georgia Public Safety Training Center in Forsyth, Georgia. Um, he's been a local business owner here for the last 10 years. Will and his wife, Marla, currently live in Elko and have two daughters, Ramsey and Rose. In his spare time, he enjoys the outdoors and working in the yard. So these are our newest firefighters, um, and we're proud to have them. So you all want to say anything? <laughs> I expected a long speech. <laughs> All right. Well, well, Thank y'all. Everyone is very welcome. We think you using the Perry Fire Department to put your careers, and we look forward to a very long service. And we would like for each one of you to be safe every single day in what you do. We appreciate your service to protect each and every one of us each day. Thank you very much. Item 7 are appointments to boards and commissions and authorities. 7A, this will be the mayor and council folks 1, district 1, 2, and 3 appointments. The first group of appointments will be to the Perry Planning Commission. Uh, council members, you have been provided with a slate of candidates for the Planning Commission. Uh, mayor Walker's election would be Eric Edwards. Mrs. Byron Grace's election is Patricia Jefferson. Dr. Aldrin's election is Jim Meserly, and Robert Jones has selected James Moody to serve in his seat. These are four-year terms on the Planning Commission, and at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve this slate of candidates for the Planning Commission. So, okay. motion is second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that the Planning Commission nominees were approved unanimously. The second group will be for the Perry Public Facilities Authority. These will be the Mayor and Council Post 1, Dash District 1, 2, and 3 appointments. I have a slate of candidates that have been recommended uh, to Council. Uh, the first one is Jeff Leonard, who will be the appointment of Mayor Walker. Uh, ben, ben Hulbert is the appointment of Daryl Aldred, and Mike Crowley would be the appointment of Robert Jones, and Belinda C. Baker would be the appointment of Ms. Byron Grace. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve this slate of candidates. So moved. Second. Motion is second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that the Perry Public Facilities Authority slate was approved unanimously. Thank you, council members. Item 8 is community partner updates. Is there any community partner here this evening that would like to address mayor and council at this time? Thank you. Item 9 are citizens with input. Is there any citizen here this evening that would like to address mayor and council at this time? Item 10 is a public hearing. The purpose of this public hearing is to provide any interested parties with an opportunity to express their views and concerns in accordance with OCGA 36-66-4. This public hearing is now open. Item 10A is a special exception 299-2021. The applicant is Rodney P. McDaniel. A request for a special exception to allow short-term residential room. The property is located at 606 Amherst Street. The tax map number, tax map number is 0 p 570 Miss Warden. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, if you will, I'll um, do a brief introduction to the next four items and um, go through those standards, and then we'll go through, through the others a little quicker. Um, but starting with this one, we'll do an overview. Um, in August 2021, City Council adopted amendments to the Land Management Ordinance making short-term residential rentals a use that may be allowed in residential districts only by special exception. So using a contracted service, we've identified 11 <coughs> short-term rentals in Perry and notified those property owners of their requirement to get this special exception. 
four of those property owners removed their listings. Um, five have filed applications with us. And then um, two property owners will fi have filed applications after the initial deadline. So we'll be hearing those later. Those updates to the land management ordinance included the addition of definitions for short-term residential rental and bed and breakfast in. A short-term residential rental means a furnished dwelling unit used to provide overnight accommodations for periods of less than 30 days to transients for compensation. This use type is regulated under the visitor accommodations category in Article 4. A bed and breakfast in means an owner-occupied dwelling having 10 or fewer guest rooms where overnight accommodations are provided to transients for compensation. Meals may or may not be served. Um, the short-term rental of rooms in an owner-occupied dwelling is classified as a bed and breakfast inn. This use is also regulated under the visitor accommodations um, use category. The standards are similar for each of these uh, forthcoming applications requesting the special exception for a short-term rental, um, and this analysis applies to all four of these coming before you. Number one, are there covenants and restrictions pertaining to the property which would preclude the proposed use of the property? Uh, staff is not aware of any covenants or restrictions on the subject property which would preclude the proposed use. Number two, does the special exception follow the existing land use pattern? Yes, in all cases, the subject properties are located within areas of similar zoning classifications and usually within an established neighborhood. Number three, will the special exception have an adverse effect on the comprehensive plan? Um, all properties are located in the suburban residential character area of the 2017 Joint Comprehensive Plan. This character area is typically developed with single-family residential subdivisions, duplexes, and apartment complexes. Uh, suggested land uses here include residential, public, and institutional, and parks and recreation uses. Number four, will adequate fire and police protection be available? Uh, fire and police protection are already provided to each of these properties and the proposed use would not impact those services. Number five, will the proposed use be of such location, size, and character that it is not detrimental to surrounding properties? Uh, renting an existing house on a short-term basis should not be detrimental to any surrounding properties. <coughs> Other than the tenants changing on a more frequent basis, short-term rental um, should not be any different than the normal occupancy of a single-family home. Uh, number six, will the use interfere with normal traffic, pedestrian, or vehicular in the neighborhood? Short-term rental of residences should not cause inappropriate interference with the normal pedestrian or vehicle traffic. Number seven, will the, result will the use result in an increase in population density, which would overtax public facilities? Short-term rental uh, of a residence should not increase the population density above that expected for the size of the house. Number eight, will the use create a health hazard or public nuisance? Short-term rental of the residence should not create a health hazard and normally should not create a public nuisance. Renters who may use the property as a party house or otherwise disturb the normal peace and quiet of the neighborhood may result in the special exception being suspended or revoked. Number nine, will the property values in adjacent areas be adversely affected? Short-term rental of residence of a residence should not adversely affect any property values. And number 10, are there substantial reasons a permitted use cannot be used at um, the subject properties? Each property is developed as a permitted use, a single family home, and a special exception to allow rental of the property on the basis um, those would be a permitted use. So our first case is special use um, 299. This property is located at 606 Amherst Street within the existing Wooden Eagle subdivision. Um, here's an aerial view of that home. The subject property owner offers the entire three bedroom, two bath house for short term rental for up to six guests. Um, offering the entire house for rent meets the definition of short term residential rental. This application meets the standards for granting a special exception for short-term residential rental use. Staff recommended approval of this application as reflected in the staff report with the following conditions. 
Number one, the special exception is limited to the current owners of the subject property, Rodney P. and Naomi McDaniel, and is not transferable. Number two, the special exception is limited to short-term rental of the existing house for up to six guests at any given time. Number three, the property owner must obtain and maintain an annual City of Perry occupational tax certificate for the duration of time in which the subject property is offered for short-term rental. Number four, the property owner shall remit all required taxes and fees associated with the short-term rental as required by law. And number five, failure of the property owner and its guests to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws may result in the suspension or revocation of the special exception. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this application with those same conditions. Questions? Relative to special exception 299-2021 at 606 Amherst Street. Thank you, Ms. Horton. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak in favor of this application? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application? Thank you. Item 10B is the special exception 302-2021. The applicant is Peggy S. Baker, a request of special exception to allow bed and breakfast in a short-term rental. The property is located at 205 Addington Chase. The tax map number is 0P06500950000. Ms. Horton. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, this subject property is located at 205 Addington Chase within Addington Glen subdivision. Subject property owner offers two guest bedrooms in their four-bedroom, two-bath house for short-term rental for up to four guests. The owner maintains residence at the subject property, and because only a portion of the house is rented on a short-term basis, the property is owner-occupied and meets the definition of a bed and breakfast inn. This application meets the standards for granting a special exception for short-term rental. Staff recommended approval of this application as reflected in the staff report with the following five conditions. Number one, the special exception is limited to the current owner of the subject property, Peggy S. Baker, and is not transferable. Number two, the special exception is limited to the short-term rental of up to two guest bedrooms for up to four total guests at any given time. Number three, the property owner must obtain and maintain an annual City of Perry occupational tax certificate for the duration of time in which portions of the subject property are offered for short-term rental. Number four, the property owner shall remit all required taxes and fees associated with the short-term rental as required by law. And number five, a failure of the property owner and its guests to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws may result in the suspension or revocation of the special exception. The Planning Commission recommended approval with the same conditions. Question is council member relative to 205 Arlington Chase. Or Addington Chase. Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening would like to speak in favor of this application? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application at 205 Addington Chase? Thank you. Item 10C is a special exception 317-2021. The applicant is Victor R. Lozano. I request a special exception to allow bed and breakfast in a short-term rental. The property is located at 117 Sutton Drive. The tax map number is 0P07000290. Ms. Horton. Thank you, Mayor. 
Mayor and Council, this subject property is located at 117 Sutton Drive within the Sutton Place subdivision. A uh, subject property owner offers three bedrooms and one and a half bathrooms in his four bedroom, two and a half bath house for short term rental for up to seven guests. Each bedroom of the home is offered using separate listings. Because only a portion of the um, house is rented on a short term basis and the property is owner occupied, it meets the definition of a bed and breakfast inn. This application meets the standards for granting a special exception for short term residential use. And staff recommended approval of this application as reflected in your staff report with the following five conditions. Uh, number one, special exception is limited to the current owner of the subject property, Victor R. Lozano, and is not transferable. Number two, the special exception is limited to short-term rental of up to three bedrooms for up to seven guests at any given time. Number three, the property owner must obtain and maintain an annual city care occupational tax certificate for the duration of time in which the subject property is offered for short-term rental. Number four, the property owner shall remit all required taxes and fees associated with the short-term rental as required by law. And number five, failure of, this, of the property owner and its guests to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws may result in the suspension or revocation of the special exception. The Planning Commission recommended approval with the same five conditions. Councilmember's questions about 117 Sutton Place. Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak in favor of this application at 117 Sutton Drive? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of the application at 117 Sutton Drive? Thank you. Item 10D is a special request or a special exception request. It's 319-2021. The applicant is Patricia Atkins. They're requesting a special exception to allow a bed and breakfast in short-term rental. The property is located at 2047 Northside Road. The tax map number is OP16BO046000. Ms. Wharton. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, this subject property owner offers two guest bedrooms in a three-bedroom, three-bath house for short-term rental for up to four guests. The owner maintains residence at the subject property. And because only a, only a portion of the house is rented, um, this one also meets the definition of a bed and breakfast inn. Uh, this one also meets the standards for granting a special exception. Staff has recommended approval of this application as reflected in your staff report with the following five conditions. One, the special exception is limited to the current owner of the subject property, Pat Patricia N. Aikens, and is not transferable. Number two, the special exception is limited to the short-term rental of up to two guest bedrooms for up to four total guests at any given time. Number three, the property owner must obtain and maintain an annual City of Perry occupational tax certificate for the duration of time in which portions of the subject property are offered for short-term rental. Number four, the property owner shall remit all required taxes and fees associated with the short-term rental as required by law. And number five, failure of the property owner and its guests to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws may result in the suspension or revocation of this special exception. The Planning Commission also recommended approval with the same conditions. Thank you. Council members, what questions do you have about 2047 Northside Drive's application for special exception? Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak in favor of this application for 2047 Northside Road? <coughs> Is there anyone here that would like to speak in application, um, in opposition of this application for 2047 Northside Road? Thank you. Item 10E is a special exception 320-2021. The applicant is Matthew King of Crown 
real estate, requesting a special exception to allow multifamily development. The property is located at 2, 2 2141 Highway 127. The tax net number is 0P06100280000. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, the subject property is a 22-acre parcel um, located on Highway 127. The applicant here proposes to develop a mix of duplex and traditional multifamily apartment units with the apartments constructed in four three-story buildings. In total, the applicant proposes 200 first-class garden-style units with 44 duplexes, 60 one-bed, one-bath units, 72 two-bed, two-bath units, and 24 three-bed, two-bath units. The development proposed will include an amenity center, courtyard area, resort-style pool, kitty park, dog park, and I'm sure many other things. Um, the exterior of the buildings will be constructed using brick and stone with exposed wood timbers and um, a complementary color scheme to suit the character of the area. Uh, rents for the apartments are projected to be $1,050 for the one-bedroom units, $1,250 for two-bed units, $1,550 for three-bed units, and $1,850 for duplexes. The applicant states that the proposed rents and number of units will support a development that's more exclusive and includes a significant amount of green space and landscaping to support the aesthetics of the property. Uh, the subject property for this development includes a portion of the land required for the city of Perry to construct a regional stormwater detention pond. The applicant is aware of these plans and has submitted a site plan that accommodates the city's design for that detention pond. There are 10 standards for granting a special exception and staff has provided analysis for each of these. Number one, are there covenants and restrictions pertaining to the property which would preclude the proposed use of the property. Um, there are no known covenants or restrictions on the subject property. Number two, um, does the special exception follow the existing land use pattern? Um, looking at this image of the zoning map, properties to the north are zoned PUD in the city. Uh, properties to the south are zoned RAG in the county and used for um, single family homes. Properties to the east are zoned C2 general commercial in the city, and they're currently undeveloped. And properties to the west are zoned RAG in the county and R2A single family residential in the city. Um, some of those are undeveloped, and the R2A portion includes the Greystone subdivision. Number three, will the special exception have an adverse effect on the comprehensive plan? Uh, there's no expected adverse effect on the comprehensive plan. The character areas map of the 2017 joint comp plan identifies the property as suburban residential in nature, and the proposed use and development are aligned with the plan's suggested development patterns of higher density housing near commercial centers or along arterial roads. <clears throat> Number four, will adequate fire and police protection be available? Um, yes, the proposed development will be adequately served by Perry Fire and Emergency Services and police. It's also um, located within 2,000 feet of the Davis Farm Fire Station. Number five, will the proposed use be of such location, size, and character that it is not detrimental to surrounding properties? The proposed use as a multifamily development is not expected to be detrimental to those surrounding properties. The applicant proposes to use the materials and finishes that are complementary to Perry's character. The proposed density of 200 units is significantly less than the allowable density on the subject property. 20 units per acre are allowed as outlined in the land management ordinance, which would be 440 units in this case. Um, the proposed density will be 12 and a half dwelling units per acre, even after you subtract the property for the detention pond. The proposed site plan reflects the duplex units in the rear of the property, which is adjacent to the single family homes in the Greystone subdivision. So here's the, here's the uh, site plan for you to look at. Those duplexes are at the rear, so it would be a more gentle transition from the single family homes in Greystone. Number six, will the use interfere with normal traffic, pedestrian or vehicular in the neighborhood? The proposed use is 
not expected to interfere with the traffic in the area. The proposed development is located on a five-lane arterial road and has adequate capacity to support the multifamily housing. Number seven, will the use result in an increase in population density which would overtax public facilities? The proposed multifamily development is not anticipated to overtax existing facilities and the applicant states that the proposed 200 units would be less burdensome than the allowable 440 units. Regarding infrastructure, um, the City of Perry and uh, City of Perry Water and Sewer Service will need to be established at the subject property. Stormwater infrastructure will be constructed at the subject property through the City of Perry's Regional Stormwater Detention Pond. This pond will have adequate capacity to serve this proposed development. Regarding streets, the primary street impacted by the proposed development is Georgia Highway 127. This road has been identified as an arterial and has adequate capacity to serve this use. Regarding schools, the Houston County Board of Education has been notified of this proposed development and staff is not aware of any capacity issues related to schools. Number eight, will the use create a health hazard or public nuisance? The proposed multifamily development is not expected to create any health hazards or nuisances. Number nine, Will property values in adjacent areas be adversely affected? The applicant states that the proposed development will enhance property values in the area due to the high quality construction, materials and finishes, and intentional layout of the property and homes. The applicant's layout with the duplexes in the rear of the property is intended to serve as a gentle transition from those nearby single family homes. The applicant has also demonstrated the appropriate landscaping and masonry wall, which would serve as a buffer for those single family homes in Greystone. And number 10, are there substantial reasons a permitted use cannot be used at this property? There is no demonstrated evidence that the proposed use cannot be permitted within the C1 Highway Commercial District. Um, staff recommended approval of this application at the um, Planning Commission hearing. Um, with one condition, and that is that exterior siding that's used shall be cement fiber material. Um, the planning commission recommended approval as well with the same condition. I've also got some photos that the developer has provided to show what these are expected to look like. And these renderings have been developed with the exact um, scale and everything in mind. Questions that council may have. Questions, council members, relative to this application. Ms. Ward, this is a brief rehash from our free council session. Uh, to my understanding, this structure cannot be occupied and or issued a certificate of occupancy until our regional stormwater pond is completed. Is that correct? That's correct. would begin before the regional retention pond is completed or that the construction would begin after that? Um, I can't speak to the exact timeline of the developer's construction, but um, if it's completed, it would not be issued a certificate of occupancy um, until the regional pond is constructed. And also as a follow-up to that, um, something the developer indicated in the pre-council meeting uh, is that no temporary uh, stormwater uh, plan or, or project will be implemented by the developer beforehand. Is that correct? That's, yes, sir. That's, that's my understanding that um, they don't desire to do any temporary stormwater. Other questions, Council? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of the application for this multifamily development? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition 
of this application. Yes, would you please come and identify yourself and to the mic, please? I mean, we'd like to have your name and address clear. I'm Scott Westmoreland. I live at 150 Langston Road, which is um, directly north of the plant urban development. And, and I'm not speaking in opposition. I didn't know, I didn't know where, which, where to jump in, but I do have a water problem, yeah. uh, significant water problem on my property. All this water shade comes through my property. So I would, at the last back in June, the council talked about building a retention pond, and, and I think I talked to Mr. Gilmore about it. And, was assured that we we're going to build a regional detention pond, but before we disrupt any more soil and start paving and, and um, occupying um, impervious, creating more impervious space, I would like to see the at least see the regional detention pond completed before um, the construction begins um, on this project. So. Where, where do you, you know, if you go ahead and build it, but just hold a CEO, we still have a water problem. And so my request would be that you at least delay the construction of, of this project until we get a re retention pond started or, or completed. Um, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition of this application. Thank you. Item 10F is special exception 323-2021. The applicant is Ida Robles, uh, Broadway Development Group, LLC. Request a special exception to expand a self-service storage facility. The property is located at 1910 Macon Road. The tax map number is 0P04016A000. Ms. Warden. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, this subject property is a four-acre parcel that's currently developed as a self-service storage facility. It was originally developed in 1997. Um, the applicant proposes to remove an existing 1,344 square foot office building and construct a 12,000 square foot climate controlled storage building and administrative office. The exterior design and materials of the new building would um, have to comply with the design standards um, within our land management ordinance. This development requires the application to obtain a special exception to use the property for self-service storage in the C2 General Commercial District. There are 10 standards for granting a special exception. Uh, staff has provided an analysis for, for each of these. restrictions pertaining to the property which would preclude the proposed use of the property. Um, staff is not aware of any covenants or restrictions on that property. Number two, does the special exception uh, follow the existing land use pattern? So looking at the zoning map there are properties to the north are zoned REG in the county um, and used for single family home. Properties to the south are zoned C2 and R1. Those include a group home and single family residential homes. Properties to the east are zoned R1. Those are used for single family homes as well. And properties to the west are zoned C2 and R3. Um, those are vacant and used for single family homes. Number three, will the special exception have an adverse effect on the comprehensive plan? Uh, the subject property is included in the suburban residential character area of the 2017 plan. This character area is typically developed with single-family residential subdivisions, duplexes, and apartment complexes. Suggested land uses include residential, public, and institutional, and parks and recreation uses. Properties in the vicinity along Macon Road include a mix of commercial, industrial, and residential uses. Number four, will adequate fire and police protection be available? Fire and police protection are already provided to the property and um, this proposed expansion would not impact those services. 
Number five, will the proposed use be of such location, size, and character that it is not detrimental to the surrounding properties? The proposed building will block the view of some of the existing metal buildings. Space for required parking is maintained and a landscape buffer is proposed adjacent to the R1 zone properties um, to the east and to the south. Will the use interfere with normal traffic, pedestrian or vehicular in the neighborhood? Self-service storage facilities do not generate consistent streams of traffic and the proposed expansion would not result in any increased traffic um, that would interfere with any normal traffic in the area. Number seven. Will the use result in an increase in population density, which would overtax public facilities? And as a storage facility, the expansion would not increase any demand on public, public facilities. Number eight, will the use create a health hazard or public nuisance? Uh, a self-service storage facility uh, should not create any health hazard or nuisances. Number nine, will property values in adjacent areas be adversely affected? The property has been used as self-storage self for over 20 years. The proposed expansion, along with related landscaping improvements, um, should not adversely affect property values in the area. And number 10, are there substantial reasons a permitted use cannot be used at the property? The current use of the property is already self-service um, storage, so um, there's no reason that a permitted use would not be allowable there. Um, staff recommended approval of this application um, as related, as reflected in their staff report um, from the Planning Commission meeting the, with two conditions. The first condition, the applicant shall replace the existing chain link fence that's visible from Macon Road with black vinyl coated chain link fence and remove the barbed wire topper on it. And number two, the applicant shall comply with the street tree and street buffer requirements of section 6-3 of the land management ordinance along the entire front of Macon Road. Uh, the Planning Commission also recommended approval of this application with those same conditions. Questions, Council? Relative to the expansion of the self-service storage facility. Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening who would like to speak in favor of this application of the expansion of the self-service storage facility? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this expansion? request 316 2021 the applicant is a seal group llc they request the de-annexation of property from the city boundary the property is located at 308 woodlands boulevard tax <coughs> number is op64802230000 miss wharton thank you mayor Mayor and Council, this subject property is located at 308 Woodlands Boulevard and is a remnant lot within the Woodlands subdivision. The property is only 47 feet wide, while the other lots along Woodlands Boulevard um, range from about 110 to 125 feet wide. The applicant requests de-annexation from the City of Perry in order to combine the subject property with the adjacent lot, which, in, which is in the City of Warner Robins, in order to construct a home that's a similar character and design as the surrounding homes. Uh, given the width of the subject lot and minimum required setbacks of 10 feet per side, the subject lot could accommodate a house, but it would only be 25 feet wide. Um, a house like this would be out of character and style for the neighborhood and the houses around it. Um, city Council's policy is not to DNX property unless the city cannot provide services to it. Uh, since this is a request for de-annexation, and no zoning classification is requested, there are no standards um, established by ordinance for your consideration. Um, the staff recommendation for the Planning Commission um, would be um, to deny this application, and the staff recommended the denial 
um, because it would be inconsistent with council's policy to not DNX property. However, um, the Planning Commission does not offer an official recommendation on this action. The informational hearing, um, there were three commissioners who voted to deny the de-annexation request and three voted to approve the request with one absent that was a tie. Uh, the commissioners that were in favor of denying the request cited their responsibility to carry out the policy set forth by council and those who um, wanted to approve the request and cited their desire to um, allow a consistent development within the Woodlands subdivision. So um, with that, I will leave it up for you for discussion. I believe you also received a memo from the city manager on this item. Question. Okay. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of this application? Yes, sir. Could you give us your name and address, please? Good evening. Uh, name is Keith Newton. I represent Nassau Group, 3528 Highway 41 North, Byron, Georgia. Uh, we are a developer of the Woodland Subdivision. Many years ago, we came before Mayor and Council with a preliminary plan and approval, and we have uh, gone through with everything as planned. Woodland Boulevard was specifically designed and approved for the larger homes, larger lots to be on the main boulevard coming through the development. Uh, some time passed and as we continued to develop, and, uh, the city made a decision not to annex any more land uh, further. Therefore, as we got to the end of the development, we were left with a 47 foot wide strip of property. We are here requesting to de-annex this 47 foot strip and allow us to combine it with the property adjoining it on the city of Warner Robins side. On the city of Warner Robins side, we already have water, sewer to the property. Um, we have uh, numerous letters we've submitted from adjoining property owners, next door neighbors across the street that have large uh, side entry garage homes. And at this time, to try to put a 25 foot wide home would not be consistent with the neighborhood it will not be approved by the architectural control committee and we're here respectfully requesting the DNX to be able to make it consistent with the development we started from day one. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions, Council? I have one question. Um, I'm sorry, I don't to the city of Perry to annex in more properties? Did you, oh, did yes, you go through yes, that? I mean, you went yes, through this formal process? We, yes, ma'am. We were denied the annexation request because of the council's position at that time. No more um, north side 127 or whatever the policy was. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Newton. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Is there anyone here anyone else in here that would like to speak in favor of this application? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application for de annexation? Thank you. Item 10 H. Annexation 325-2021. The applicant is Tom Hall, Houston County Attorney for the Houston County Development Authority. Request the annexation and rezoning of property from M-2 County to M-2 City. The property is located at North Highway 341 in the Perry Parkway. Tax map number is 0001600250. 14. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, this subject property is a 572.6 acre um, parcel located at Perry Parkway in North Highway 341. Um, the subject property is currently zoned um, M2 in Houston County and is currently used for agriculture purposes on the southern portion of the parcel and is undeveloped on the northern end of the parcel. 
um, the applicant requests annexation into the city of Perry with a zoning classification of M2 industrial for future industrial development and access to city of Perry utilities. Uh, there are no covenants or restrictions on the subject property which would preclude the uses permitted in the proposed zoning district. There are six standards for consideration when reviewing this application for annexation. Staff has provided an analysis for each of the following. Uh, number one, identify the existing land uses and zoning classification of nearby properties. Properties to the north are zoned REG in the county and M2. Um, those are uh, the M2 properties are industrial uses and the rest is undeveloped. Properties to the south are zoned county REG and they're either undeveloped or used for agricultural purposes. Properties to the east are zoned M2. Um, those are either used for industrial purposes or are undeveloped. And properties to the west are zoned county RAG. Um, those are used for single family homes and some is also undeveloped. Number two, whether the proposed zoning will allow uses that are suitable in view of the uses and development of adjacent and nearby property. The proposed zoning district is compatible with the surrounding uses. The primary land uses of the surrounding properties are industrial or undeveloped, and nearby properties are either developed as industrial properties or zoned for future industrial use. Number three, whether the proposed zoning will adversely affect the existing use or usability of adjacent or nearby property. The proposed zoning district and industrial development are similar to the uses of surrounding property. The applicant states that the proposed zoning is a similar zoning classification in Houston County and has been designated for industrial use for many years. Number four, whether the zoning proposal is in conformity with the policies and intent of the comprehensive plan. Um, the subject property is very large and is actually located in four different character areas. Um, the Gateway Corridor, Industrial, Agricultural, and Suburban Residential Character Area. Um, however, the majority of this property is in the Industrial Character Area. The proposed zoning district is consistent with the comprehensive plan and its suggested development pattern of new industry located in areas accessible by transit, walking, or biking, and suggested land use designation of industrial. Number five, whether the zoning proposal will result in a use which will cause an excessive burden upon existing streets, transportation facilities, utilities, or schools. The proposed zoning district will not cause an excessive burden on existing public facilities. Regarding infrastructure, water and sewer service will need to be established at the subject property for any future industrial use. The applicable local, state, and federal regulations will be met, and the City of Perry has the capacity to serve any future industrial development there. Regarding roads, the primary roads impacted because of any future industrial development are Perry Parkway and North Highway 341. Uh, both of those roads are identified as arterials and have the capacity to serve any future industrial development. Regarding schools, uh, staff is not aware of any issues that would be related to the capacity of education facilities from this development. And number six, whether there are existing or changing conditions that would affect the use and development of the property which gives supporting grounds for either approval or disapproval of the zoning proposal. The subject property is located in a similar zoning district within Houston County and has been designated for industrial use. Annexation with the requested zoning district of N2 would have no impact on the type of permitted uses. Um, City of Perry staff recommended approval of this application and the Perry Planning Commission also recommended approval of this one. Thank you, Ms. Borden. Council members, questions relative to this request from the House and County Development Authority for this annexation. Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak in favor of this application from the House and County Development Authority?
Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Item 10 is text request 324 2021. The applicant, the City of Perry, requests modification to the land management ordinance section 5-1.2 to authorize City Council to grant multifamily residential density greater than those established in Table 5-1-1 by a special exception and only for adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, as we discussed earlier, this came about as a result of inquiries that we've been fielding last year, primarily relating to conversion of some of our older motels into multifamily residential districts. And as we look further into those, we realize that if those were to move forward, that more than likely they would result in a higher residential density than is currently allowed in the ordinance. What we have recommended here is a modification to the ordinance that gives Council the authority to grant a higher density in those situations where an existing building is being adaptively reused for residential purpose or mixed use with residential. The special exception standards that currently exist, we believe, already gives you the authority to evaluate that density and its appropriateness on an individual basis. The staff recommends approval and the Planning Commission also recommended approval of this request. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Council members, any questions relative to this application for a text change? I don't have a question, but I do think it's, like you stated already, and I think it's a benefit to citizens listening either here or on any recording to know that this ability to increase density is only, in this text, is only going to apply to a building that already exists and is being changed and being repurposed. Correct. It's not just a, okay, over here we're going to increase density. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Thank you. Is there anyone here this evening who would like to speak in favor of this application? Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application? Thank you. This public hearing is now closed. Council member, item 11 is review of the minutes. 11A, council will be provided with the minutes of the December 21st, 2021 pre-council meeting and the December 21st, 2021 council meeting. Please note that Ms. Bynum Grace was absent from the December 21st, 2021 meeting. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve these minutes as presented. Motion and second. Motion and second. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes to these minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes as presented, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously with Ms. Bynum Grace abstaining from the vote. Item 12 is old business. 12A is ordinances for the second reading and adoption. 12A is the second reading of an ordinance for the annexation of property to the city of Perry. The property is located on Houston Lake Road. The tax map number is 00081010A000. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, this property is a 1.78 acre parcel of land on Houston Lake Road near Houston Lake. The request is to annex and there are three conditions. One, the water and sanitary sewer service shall be established at and brought to the subject property at the expense of the owner. 
and number two, based on the letter from Houston County of November 9, 2021, sewer lines to service this property will not be allowed to be located on county-owned properties. And number three, this parcel will be a county uh, water customer. I'll be happy to answer correct your questions. Council members, questions relative to this annexation request? Is there anyone here this evening that would like to address mayor and council relative to this ordinance? Thank you. At this time, council, I'll entertain a motion that outlines your desire relative to this annexation request. Mayor, I recommend denial of the annexation request. We have a motion to deny the annexation request. There's a motion and a second. All in favor of denying the request, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same. Please let the record show that the application for annexation was denied unanimously. Item 12A2. Council members, since you have denied the request for annexation, uh, and there is no reason to move forward with rezoning the property because we do not have a property in the city of Perry to rezone. Correct, Mr. Thank you. Item 13 is in the old business. 13A is in the old business from the, from the mayor. I do not have any. Any old business from council members? Ms. By Embrace? I haven't Dr. Oliver? No, sir. Mayor Brickman. I'm a former mayor. Mr. Hunt. The new mayor Brickman. <laughs> Item 13C is the city attorney, Ms. Duty. 13D is the city manager, Mr. Gilmore. Thank you. And item 13E is Assistant City Manager, Mr. Schmidt. Yes, sir. Thank you. Item 14 is new business. Item 14A are matters referred from the January the 4th, 2022 pre council meeting. Mr. Gilmore, I have nothing that indicates that anything was referred from that meeting. That is correct. Thank you. Item 14B is a special application or special exception application. 299-2021, and this is the request uh, for 606 Amherst. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to outline your desires on this application. A motion to accept. There's a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Include, and that included the conditions. <coughs> and that included the, the conditions recommended by the uh, planning commission. Yes, I would. If we can outline that in your motion, then make a motion to accept the recommendation with the outlines uh, pertained in the package. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I have a motion. A motion to accept. Is there a second? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that. Application 299-2021 was approved unanimously. Thank you, Council. 14C is a special act, special exception application 301-2021. This is 205 Abington Chase. Mr. Wood, any comments? Just this one has rec uh, recommended conditions as well. Okay. Thank you, Council. At this time, I will entertain a motion that outlines your desires for movement on this application. Mayor, I recommend approval subject to the conditions outlined by planning and zoning. I have a motion. Okay. There's a motion, there's a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you. Please let the record show that the special exception was approved unanimously. 14D is a special exception application 317-2021. This is 117 Sutton Drive. Mr. Wood? Nothing further. Did, did it come with any this, conditions? Yes, this one had conditions as well. Conditions as well. Council members, I will 
entertain a motion that outlines your desires on 117 Sutton Drive. Mayor, recommend approval subject to the conditions as outlined by planning and zoning. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that application 317-2021 was approved unanimously. Item 14E is special exception application 319-2001. This is 2047 Northside Road. Mr. Wood? Yes, this was recommended by the commission with five conditions as well. Council members, at this time, I'll entertain a motion that outlines your desires on this application. Mayor, I move that we approve the application subject to the conditions <coughs> placed by planning and zoning. Second. I have a motion. Second. Second. There's a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Mr. Hunt? You're opposed? Opposed? All opposed. Okay. Please let the record show that Mr. Hunt was opposed. Approved with a vote of, it was approved with a vote of five to one. 14F is a special exception application 320-2021. This is the request on the apartments at 2141 Highway 27. 127, excuse me. Mr. Wood? Yes, this was recommended by the planning commission with one condition. Okay. Council members, I will entertain a motion to. Before we vote, I just have a question. Given the concern, I guess, raised by Mr. Westmoreland is there. I guess this question is for Ms. Newby. Can a, help me out here, can a condition be placed that building not be in before the retention bond is completed? I think that you can place a condition on here, but I believe that the applicant is present with us if you have further questions for him. Relative to the concern about the pond, and this may be a question more so for Mr. McMurray, who is not here tonight. Relative to construction of the site happening simultaneously as construction of the pond. That may be something such that the pond is complete prior to the rest of the construction. I mean, that was my understanding from the applicant earlier in the pre-council meeting was that he would be willing to work with the city relative to construction of the pond. But I think that he would be able to speak to that better. Could I just add to that before he responds? I have something I want to add to before he gets up. I think where the council is coming from with this particular issue is that disturbance of the soil there has resulted in extreme water, extremely negative storm water situations. And the residents there have been given certain, a description of what the city is going to do to alleviate that. That has nothing to do with you, I'm sorry. But none of those things have occurred as yet, which increases the anxiety about the apartments coming. So that you're just having to, I'm sorry, follow along behind a situation that already created angst. And we haven't had any of those remediations done that the neighbors had anticipated. So my question would be maybe for Mr. Gilmore. Was it, I'm not sure of the length of time, but three or four months ago maybe, or maybe longer than that, we had a developer in that area wanting to develop that land. And I think in the discussions, if my memory serves me correctly, we were going to start work on this original detention pond. I guess that's the correct verbiage. But as of right now, nothing's happened out there in that respect. Are we waiting to get land from the developer to put it, or what goes first? To 
cover back up and go back over uh, the all the design work and everything for the pond has been completed. Uh, we are in negotiations with the property owner, or my understanding is the potential property owner, which is the apartment complex, about purchasing uh, the land. And once we know with our time frame of purchasing the land, then our normal process would be to go out to bid. Then the construction is done. We did talk about that, that previous project that Councilmember Albright was talking about is that the developer was able to start some type of construction, uh, but would be monitored relative to any type of impact or, or the developer would have to cease at a particular time if it looked like that development was starting to uh, impact any more on the flow that we're having. And I think that may be one of the conditions that you could uh, you know, possibly impose. If that becomes some type of issue, then I would suggest that the developer can come back. However, you may remember, and unless I'm mistaken, the developer has given every indication of its willingness to cooperate with the city for this project on whatever needs to be done, including, which may be a viable option, that the construction of the pond is tied into through the developer with the construction of the project. You know, we would have to take a look at that as an option. A uh, couple of important points I think to point out is one, as the developer has indicated, there's still a whole series of permitting process and everything that still have to be done for this project. Uh, and the second thing is, is that we anticipate resolve very quickly the issue about the land. If it's on our part, then of course we would have to go to bid and you have the regular bidding process and so on and so forth. The other thing I want to remind council members on is that this project has some potential relative to Dr. Westmoreland's property. But you may remember the primary issues of storm water for Dr. Westmoreland's property is water coming down Langston Road. And we have not done any more with that because we've talked about working in conjunction with the new regional pond as well as some discussions with the county on how to go in and address that. Because you may remember in that particular case for Dr. Westmoreland, it's more of an issue about the water coming down and not turning at the subdivision. Does everybody remember the whole the discussion we had on that and the direction of the water and how that could be handled? Um, and, and so there, I don't know if that totally answers your question, Dr. Albright, but that's where we are with this particular project. Are you saying that this new project would not impact the water because of its location, because it's not, I mean, is that what you're saying? I, I think I'm confused as to why, if the water is coming down Langston Road, why do we have to wait for the retention pond over here to get completed? I mean, you see. My you, government will, Langston, my government will impact speak on the stormwater um, detention pond is we have to have that in place before we can start construct our vertical construction anyhow because all of our stormwater runoffs have to go to that pond so therefore that all has to be done before we can go vertical and create any impervious surfaces so it, it to be done prior is fine um, simultaneously would be even better we're hoping we talk with the city and i'm hoping we can do all the site work, I mean, we can do the detention pond, and then you guys would come in and purchase that now from us at six plus acres. Um, either purchase or trade off for tax credits, you know, whatever the conversation is. Um, but anyway, so the detention pond has to be in place. 
either as the construction is going on or prior. Oh, so you would build a detention pond? That's one thought. I mean, of course, that's up to the city um, because it is on our land and it does affect our development. Um, I would like to be in control of it, to be honest with you, if possible. So, I mean, we have that around the DC company anyway. So. And I mean, that would also speed up our process because then you wouldn't have to take the bid. Okay, well that, I think that part kind of throws me a little bit because when we talked about it earlier, you said there wouldn't be anything that was temporary. <laughs> but no, no, no. Uh, but you building a small detention pond to no, later no, hook on to no, the no, big no, one. This, no, 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 we built the big one. The big one's on our property currently, the design. Okay. I see the city, you guys want to purchase that piece of property from the 22 acres. Why would that not be done prior to him to, I mean, why wouldn't we, do, are we in possession? We're not in, we're not in possession of all the land we need. We don't have any of that property title to And I'm sorry, well, Ms. Peterson, to speak to that, um, we've been working on negotiating with the property owner, the current property owner, which would be the potential seller to the developer. So that would be negotiations that would happen between my office and the then property owner relative to the city acquiring the property. So just like we've had um, discussions with other property owners that are also impacted from the, the regional stormwater pond, um, you can acquire a property not just through um, us purchasing it, but there could be a trade-off in that because there will have to do some site work on the rest of their property that they can do some of the site work, but it would all be according to the city's pond design and the city's approved plans. And, and I, I'm really not asking those kinds of questions about how we go about acquiring it or anything like that. I think I'm, I'm trying to understand the point that the city is not in possession of all the land at this current time for the pond. And so the timetable for this pond to become operational right. is much longer than was originally thought. Um, and so maybe, well, a few months ago when we had a community informational hearing, it sounded like maybe, maybe they were like nine or 10 months away from it being operational, but that's. You know. Yeah, in, in the past three or, three or four months, you know, we've been in direct contact with the city engineer, which we've gotten the stormwater pond design, and we've taken that and Consideration and designed our our complex around that. So when you say this for, for us, that pond has to be done either before we start construction or during the construction. But there won't be any temporary pond in place. And Ms. Peterson, relative to the timeline, um, the city had been waiting on a redesign of the pond. We have the pond, um, the pond design reviewed by a third party, Kimberly Horn, to receive their feedback, and so that's part of the oh, that's part of the process in making sure that it was designed properly. But that has nothing that's that has nothing to do with this proposed development. That was the city's own review of our regional stormwater pond, and, and I don't have an issue with the development. I mean, that's, that's not my point at all. Um, it's just that's been a, um, an ongoing situation, and uh, this other project that uh, Mr. Gilmore mentioned, uh, where there was going to be some coordination between construction and the development of the pond, uh, that didn't pass. We didn't do it. And so we, we're, we have a lot of concern for uh, that water situation, and we don't just don't want it to get worse before it gets better. So, just so I'm understanding, you currently do not own this property? No, sir. Okay. I'm not the current owner. Um, depending on how this goes, if we get, we get past tonight, then we will proceed to start the property and then we'll um, talk about it. So. And you, you mentioned that you are, you are okay with building this detention pond either right as you start or during maybe the phase, the 
initial phase of the development? Yes, sir. Because typically, we've already had our soil borings. Uh, the dirt from that six acres, we would put back into our, our slabs. And so this, uh, this regional, you would be building the city of Perry regional detention bonds out. Yes, sir. So that's, what's your thought on that, Mr. Gilmore? Is that what they would well, I, I think we actually can have kind of a compromise here. Uh, first off, I want to point out, unless there's some other extensive agreement, uh, I do not envision that the developer would be contracting and doing the entire regional attention pond. Because there's a lot more aspects that aren't directly affecting uh, its property there. However, he has made uh, an offer, and I think as a compromise, we can come back, or you all can have as a condition for the special exception, is that they cannot proceed with any of the construction unless there is whatever portion of that pond, which is not a good section of their property, is dug out, cleared, whatever the case may be, to act as a holding area for any potential runoff from the construction. And, just like we talked about before, they can't get the CO until the uh, regional pond is complete. So in other words, going back on the developer's proposal, there could be, I guess, what, six acres? I forget what it is, some portion of the pond that's on their property. They could come in underneath our specifications, dig that out, if they had, dig that out, and that's where their stormwater goes. Are you with me? But it doesn't flow or go any place else or any more than what's already flowing off the property. So in other words, whatever their new construction is would not if it got that point, would not be affected by the fact that the regional pond is not complete. And if it does, we can shut the construction down. That, that's exactly right. And that's, that's, and that's, one, that's one of the conditions. That's right. And that's, that's not, you know, too crowded. I mean, that's, that's our standard practice no matter what. You know, if there's problems with stormwater off the construction site, then the construction site is stopped until it gets resolved. And I understand from the developer, his thoughts are that he needs that dirt himself to move back into his property and be right. Right. use it for a fill and all when his it helps to balance the side yes sir and that, that of course in, in this particular case would be well if we own it or before we probably not quite sure but they would be digging out that material that we would have to dig out anyway but it'd be done on their dime for their project but the total pond was what, 14 acres? Right. And so this would just be six. Yes, but it would it would be enough to settle or handle any other runoff that's projected to come off his site. But we're so forget, to... council members, this regional pond has a big <coughs> wide area that it's talking about having to drain. It's not just this one part. But my opinion, we're going to be doing this simultaneously at the time he's doing his. We're, yes. We're not holding up in the regional pond. We'll go to bid for the remainder of that eight acres or nine acres we've got to do, and it will be put in place before it, we will allow the CO to go there. The regional pond total. The total regional pond. Yes. 14 acres. And that's, that's what we're talking about. Right. But on an interim basis, he pull out whatever fill or material he uses, and then that's, if that's such a problem, that's where his runoff bureau would sit. Which brings me back to my first concern was, will, when will the other items that were talked to uh, talked about for Langston Road water problems in general, do they have to wait until? I mean, is nothing be done because we've been waiting for the pond, or what? What's the status of those, or what should people in that area expect? Uh, we, I will follow up on that and get back with you and, and let you know. If there's something we can do that's not directly tied to the construction of the regional pond, right. then as far as I know right now, we'll go ahead and proceed and start on some of that. That may be some of the redoing of the, um, 
turn where it goes around Lake Forest subdivision. Mm -hmm. Remember that was a mm -hmm. discussion there? Yes. You know, some of that type of stuff we may be able to get in conjunction with the county right away. And if we can, then we would. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you. Any other questions? Council, at this time, I'll entertain a motion of your preference on 2141 Highway 127. Is there a motion? Mr. Wood, any additional? Nothing further. 
Council members, this is the first reading of this ordinance and does not require any action by the council tonight. 14H2 is the first reading of an ordinance for the annexation of property to the city of Perry. The property is located at North Highway 341 and Perry Parkway. Tax map number is 00016002500. Mr. Wood? Nothing further. Council members, this is the first reading of this ordinance and does not require any action on the part of the council. 14H3 is the first reading of an ordinance for the rezoning of property from M-2 County to M-2 City. The property is located at North Highway 341 and Perry Parkway. Tax map number is 00016002500. Mr. Wood? Nothing further, Mayor. Council members, this is the first reading of this ordinance and no action is required on the part of the council tonight. Item 14H4 is the first reading of an ordinance to amend section 5-1.2 of the land management ordinance relative to increasing maximum density for adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Mr. Wood? Nothing further. Council members, this is the first reading of this ordinance and no action is required by the council this evening. 14I is the award of bids. 14I1 is bid number 2022-19. This is the splash pad concrete addition. Mr. Worthington? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, this is a project to install a concrete apron around the splash pad that's at Creekwood Park. It will address some drainage issues that are out there. Following all of our standard bid processes resulted in no bids for this project, so we directly solicited McWright LLC, who's a local vendor, and actually helped us prepare the bid specs. The proposal they gave us was for $40,750. There's funding available in the 2018 SPLOS fund for this project, and staff would recommend that we award this bid to McWright LLC. Questions, Council, relative to this bid? Hearing none, at this time I'll entertain a motion to approve the bid as presented by Mr. Worthington. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show the bid was approved unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Worthington. Thank you. Fifteen is Council member items. Ms. Bonbray. None. Dr. Albert. Mr. Jones. Mayor Perkins. Thank you. Mr. Gilmore, anything for us this evening? Yes, Mayor. One item. My office was contacted today by the House and County Board of Commissioners, and with the widening of a portion of House and Lake Road, the county is proposing to install street lights in that section. Cost of those street lights will be part of the countywide SPLOS project. However, in order to proceed, the county is requesting that an intergovernmental agreement be done between the city and the county, indicating that when those lights have been completed and accepted, that the city would take over the operation and maintenance of them. This is a standard practice that the county has done for road improvements in the city of Centerville and the city of Warner Robins. This one is a little more time-consuming because it's on a state route, so they have to go through DOT, but they would like to have council's approval that they will agree to this intergovernmental agreement. I think this is an excellent way for us to improve the lighting out in that area without us having to pay the cost up front, so the administration would recommend to you to approve this subject to final draft, but the intergovernmental agreement. This would require a vote subject to the city attorney's approval, is what we're recommending. And this is common practice. We maintain lights all over town. Yes. And there were lights out there before they started on the project that we maintain and pay for. Yes. This is just a replacement. Well, and 
additional. Yeah, an additional life test. <coughs> yes. Questions, counsel? Yes, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve the request for the maintenance and acceptance of, of an interim governmental agreement with the county, uh, subject to approval by our city attorney. So moved. Okay. Motion and second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Please let the record show that the request was approved unanimously. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Gilmore? No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Smith? No, sir. Ms. Newman, anything for us this evening? Item 16, our department head items. Mr. Worthington, anything for us? Nothing, President. Mr. Wood? Yes, Mayor, but we'd like to just uh, let you know and the public know that uh, we had a record breaking year with residential permits. We exceeded 500 for the first time with 503 uh, new single family permits issued in 2021. Congratulations. Thank you. And we'll continue inspecting all of them. In 2022. Good, thank you. Mr. Davis. All is good. Huh? All is good? All is good. Uh, just one thing, I want to say thank you for approving the inflatable fire safety house, and we'll get on that right away. Okay. We look forward to it at our food truck front. Mr. Swan. Also. Ms. Fitzner. Ms. Warren, anything from the city clerk's office? Yes, Ms. Clark. Nothing tonight, sir. Ms. Harden. Nothing tonight, just Happy New Year, and I'm looking forward to economic development in the city of Perry in 2022. Thank you. Ms. Wharton, anything additional? Nothing Is that anybody else back there? Did mm -hmm. I miss anybody? It's part of the problem being short. So, thank you. Item 17 are general public items. Is there anyone in the general public this evening that would like to address mayor and council at this time? Yes, sir. Would you come up and address us, please? We need your name and your address, please. Robert Russell, 913 Evergreen Street. Yes, sir. Um, I was watching the pre- planning meeting, I guess it was like a little while ago, by Mr. Smith proposing to take out the parking lot and put a building down there. I've been a resident of Perry for 40 years. I watch it expand and grow. I'm getting a little concerned about the parking situation. Yes, sir. Um, we put in the news. They took out their parking. I see that New Orleans has put it in taking out their parking, so that forces people to park. It's going to force people to park on private property, which they've already started doing. Uh, we have, I have a concern with like morning, morning by morning up there because they put in like five parking places. Sometimes they'll have a hundred people there. I know you put in a strip of parking places along the side of the road, they're not being used. And it's mainly like young mothers getting out with their children. They don't park in the street, they go park over there at the Board of Education still, which the board has asked them not to do. So as we expand downtown, I'm seeing that we're taking out the public parking areas and filling them with buildings which is going to force us owners of our properties to accommodate these people somehow. So I'd like to ask the council, is there any plans, maybe take this property out here, make a parking lot, take the property we got down there by the railroad tracks and make a parking lot to ease this parking situation. You want to, one of you want to address that? Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly try. Uh, Mr. Russell, we understand your concerns about parking. Um, the Downtown Development Authority, when they proposed to put some sort of infill development project at the Ball Street Main Street parking lot, uh, were working under the assumption that the premise is that um, that is not necessarily the best use of that property, and that um, it is their mission to 
shift, shift properties to the best and highest use, promote downtown development, that type of thing. Um, as you're very aware, we're relatively landlocked in our downtown. Yes, I understand that. There's not a lot of room to grow, so um, doing what we can with existing property. It has always been the vision of our downtown to have parking on the periphery, and then people walk into the, the center of town. Yeah, 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 let me stop you on that. But the problem is the owners of the downtown parking lots are getting filled up, and people are not parking on the periphery. People, people are not going to walk any further than they have to. Well, I think that's, that's, that's a mindset that's going to have to change at some point in time. We are looking at uh, additional parking lot projects. You so, mentioned out here, uh, we are going to where be expanding. Really? We are going to be expanding the parking lot uh, behind here, uh, going into the former Stanley property. Uh, well, we well, are. What will that? What will that be? I'm not sure of an exact time frame. Uh, we have some environmental remediation work that has to be done prior to that being completed, but it it be relatively soon. Well, let me ask you, what's, what's the deal with the property required down there by the railroad track? That is in process as well. Uh, we have been working back and forth with the railroad to obtain um, an easement within the right of way to establish parking. Should be a significant amount of parking. Uh, we are also looking at some additional property acquisitions, again, on the periphery of downtown to establish some, some parking lots. Again, you know, with, with our downtown, surface parking lots in the core of downtown is just not the best use of that property. And, you know, we'll do everything we can to mitigate the loss of the core parking. Um, you know, I think the Main Street parking that was added recently by Ms. Spitzner's folks um, is, is very good. You know, I don't understand why people aren't using it. No, I don't, they don't use them, no. I, she, like I said, usually it's young mothers getting out with their trolley. That's about all it goes in that coffee shop. Younger people with families, and they don't use those parking places. As as downtown becomes more and more of a desirable place uh, for people to spend their time, uh, parking I think will continue to be a bit of an issue. But it is certainly something that is high priority on our radar at the city, um, and I assure you that we are working to address those issues. And the last thing we want to see is uh, you know, negative externalities impacting the established neighborhoods surrounding the yes. core downtown. Yes, we, we, can, we completely understand that. Yeah, um, that's, what, that's what's happening now. And, and Rand, Randall has witnessed it on Saturday morning, people are backed up in the coffee shop blocking my driveway. So it's only going to get worse. You're going to expand, the parking's going to have to expand out to the neighborhoods somehow. Again, um, we're working with the parking project. The city, the city has properties. My understanding is we're not even allowed to park on the city's property. Well, I'm not sure exactly which property you're talking about. Property down there. The property we're told there. not to park down there. Down by the railroad? Yes. That's, that's not necessarily true. I don't think that's true. No, that, that, that's true. You know, just like any other private property owner, as it stands right now, we do not allow people long term to come in and park on the site where the administration building is going to be constructed, as it stands right now. I think following up on Mr. Smith's point, if it appears to be an ongoing problem relative to the parking, that can certainly become an interim parking location similar to the parking lot next to uh, Mr. Wood's building. Well, now I do, I do know, you know, roughly, you talk about the deal about the parking. A uh, number of times I've gone by morning by morning as well, and yes, there are people who go in and they park over in the school board uh, parking lot. The school board has talked about, I believe, that they want to restrict parking when that building is active. But on the weekend, as far as I know, yeah, they can use it. Really use it. In addition to that, you have a number of people that use First Baptist Church parking lot across the street for that project. You're also starting to get people to park, and a good example was for the buzzer drop. You're getting people to now get oriented on parking on Main Street because those parking places have been clearly delineated, and people are starting to come in and park there. So I think what you're what you're starting to see is a is a transition 
of people from where they thought they historically would park to taking a look at some of the other alternatives. Yeah, I understand that. But in the interim, as we grow, is the city going to allow us to park on their property? That would have to be a decision that council makes. Can I propose that we start working in that progress? Progress? Absolutely. Well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to speak for the mayor. We, we will look at those options. I can tell you that this is a constant discussion at City Hall about where we're, we're working diligently, I'm with, we, yeah. diligently with the railroad at this time to acquire the property, and that's getting very close. As that comes to fruition, we will put the parking lots down there. We are talking to various landowners that have property that would be suitable outside of, right outside of the fringe of the downtown for a possible purchasing of their product property for parking. So this is an ongoing discussion that I have had personally, I know our city attorney has had numerous discussions and Mr. Smith has. So we're we're keenly aware of the, the need and we will we will address that. that would like to address mayor and council this evening. Thank you. Item 18 are mayor items. I uh, just want to remind everybody that our next meeting will be helping make sure it's going to be January the 18th starting with pre-council at 5 o'clock with our regular council meeting at 6. There will be no work session on January the 17th due to that as a holiday. The city hall will be closed that day. Those are the items that I have. Uh, council members, we do need to move into the executive session for the purpose of real estate. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to go into the executive session. Motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. We are in executive session at this time. 